They should look more different from us than any other life form on Earth looks from us. And they don't. And it's because they have to pay an actor to put on a rubber costume. Well, is this really a face or not? We went back there some years later to photograph the region in higher resolution. Higher resolution. If that's a face, then under higher resolution, what should it look like? A face, thank you. It should look like a better face. Okay? Right here. That's what high resolution does for you, if that's a face. So we went back. This is the same region. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you can see what might have been the eye sockets, or, but that is not a face. Okay, now there are people who so badly wanted it to be a face, they said the Martians knew we were coming back and they dusted it over. <laughs> so, okay, you know, what, what can you do with that? Uh, we took another image of it under different lighting conditions and different dust conditions, and we got that. Same reason. So I, I'm pretty convinced it's not a human face on Mars. The day after Thanksgiving, one month from today, we're going to launch this vehicle, the Mars Science Laboratory, codenamed Curiosity. That is the size of a car. That's about five times bigger than Spirit and Opportunity. That can go over obstacles. The reason why we show a rock in front of it is because it can actually step over that rock. It can step over things that are a meter tall. It is going to look for signs of life in the soil of Mars. Why? Because on Mars, there's evidence for there having once been water. And any time on Earth you find water, you find life. I don't care where the water is, underground, over, frozen, liquid, there's life. Even the Dead Sea has life. It just doesn't have fishes in it, right? So it's evidence that the people who labeled it the Dead Sea did not have a microscope, okay? <laughs> if they had a microscope, they might have called it the microbial sea. But of course, the word didn't even exist yet. <laughs> this thing is going to land in a very smooth spot. This is an extraordinary hole-in-one golf shot. We launch it from Earth, and that's a t basically a 20-mile circle there on the surface of another planet. We are moving in orbit around the Earth, so is Mars. We launch from Earth, align their trajectories, and we're going to land in a nice smooth spot. You don't want to land where it's rocky because you want to survive the landing. Then you can go joyriding over the cliffs. So where the two arrows are, those are two areas that are of high target opportunity for the Mars sample, the Mars uh, Science Laboratory. Places where we think water once was. Now this morning, I have contacts at NASA. We got the very first, um, we think we have the very first signs of life on Mars right there. <laughs> This is not public information yet, though. But just got it. Just as I was walking onto the stage, this image came down. So, um, <laughs> this thing about a, 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 a crater that looks like a human face, we have human faces, so this is what we look for. We look for familiar shapes. If we were jellyfish, we would find jellyfish formations. And say, hey, I'm a jellyfish, no more. But if it, let's, let's, let's be a little more open about what we might find. How about this? The Valentine Crater. How about, yeah. the, the craters of all, it's like looking at clouds at the beach, you know? You're looking up, there's Abraham Lincoln. No, he's not actually in the sky. It's a pattern that your brain says looks like that. How about Smiley Face Crater? <laughs> Face. How do we know there's water on Mars? Well, well, there was once water, and we think it's sunk down into the soils and is now permafrost. Here, this will take a little bit of explanation. This is a crater that was made in the time we had the orbiter over the planet. And so, what you see here on the left is the freshly made crater, and we see frost on the crater edge. Frost does not survive very long in the temperature-pressure combination of Mars. 
so it would go away. But you could say to yourself, well, maybe that's just chalky rock. Maybe that's all it is. If it's chalky rock, then two weeks later, it would still be chalky rock and look like that. But two weeks later, it begins to disappear, it begins to sublime into the atmosphere, to evaporate up and away. And so we think the water that used to be on the surface is now just a little bit below. And if it's just a little bit below and we want to look for light, maybe we've got to start digging. Maybe digging is what we need to do. Take a look at evidence of water. Here's a, here's a crater that we think was once filled in with water. It drizzled out, rolled down the, 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 the hillside, and puddled up at the bottom. You see meandering riverbeds. This is all over the planet. There are river deltas, floodplains, this sort of thing. Mars remains a high target of opportunity for this. My favorite planet, Saturn. This shot is a view from the Hubble telescope, but we're actually in, orbiting, we're in orbit around this planet right now. I love that you can see the shadow of the ball on the ring in the back there. That's not missing data, that's shadow across the ring. The ring doesn't end, of course, it continues into the shadow. On the south pole of Saturn, a couple of, like in, in 2008, was it? 2009, we found a hexagon in the clouds of one of the poles of Saturn. Now, cloudy stuff doesn't tend to make hexagons, so this is a mysterious formation in the atmosphere of Saturn. This stumped us for the longest time. Somebody in a lab finally figured out how to make one in a bathtub or, you know, a laboratory bathtub, but okay, under really special conditions he can do it, but Saturn is just out there all by itself, and we have a hexagon. So, I, I, for me, it's still a mystery why there's a hexagon on Saturn. Stay tuned for that spot. Saturn has a magnetic field, just like Earth, and there, there's solar wind that it receives, just the way Earth does. You mix a magnetic field, a solar wind, and an atmosphere, you get aurora. This is aurora in the north and south poles of Saturn. Photographed in high energy light, ultraviolet light. And so Saturn lights up in its nighttime sky with the beautiful displays of aurora just the way Earth does. This is called comparative planetology. Now we've been to Saturn and one of its moons, Titan. Titan has a thick atmosphere uh, and, and, it's, and, it, and it's, it's cold. It is so cold that water is frozen into ice and the ice is so hard, it's as hard as cement. And methane, which we know of as a gas that comes out of your stove, is liquefied on the surface so that on Titan, there are lakes of methane. And the boulders on the, board, on the, on the lake edges are ice. Here's an artist's rendering of the parachuted uh, probe that dropped onto, so that's a, that's a lake of methane. This is an artist's capture. We have images of the probe, the Huygens probe, named after a famous uh, uh, mathematician, Huygens. This is an actual image of the surface of Titan. And you see, it looks like the coastline of California. So the, on the upper left, you see the tributaries, the, the, the river tributaries, and they meet, make a bigger river, and they come down into a flat area at the bottom. That's the lake. So it's interesting that you have similar surface features to what you have on Earth, except it's not even using water. It's using something that is not in a familiar state here in that condition. It's gaseous here, on there it is naturally liquid. Now, I, one of, I always try to make sure people have cosmic perspectives. This is Saturn from the backside with the planet itself eclipsing the sun. That's why there's a glow around the edge of the ball. This is a striking, stunning image. And the, the ring is illuminated from the underside, so it takes on this magical, mystical glow. And I said, well, wait a minute, I see something in this picture. There's something there. We're looking towards the, towards the center of the solar system, as we must, because the sun is behind the planet Saturn in this picture. But I, I see something there. What is that? Okay, we zoom in. Oh, 
okay, that's Earth right there. Those six pixels. That is Earth that showed up in the picture. Earth, the planet we love and care so deeply about. It is a smudge on this photo of a much larger planet. It's images like this that give your ego, you know, they can be trying on your ego. Anyone here come in with like big human ego, human earth ego, raise your hand. You're a human ego. It's the one hand over there. We'll take care of that before that before the hour. I guarantee that. Let's move a little further out. Uh, we get to Pluto. Get over it. Okay. <laughs> have lingering Pluto issues, you can bring them up in the question and answer session. <laughs> if your therapy you've been through has not worked, <laughs> you can fix that. <laughs> Near-Earth objects, neons, these things, uh, these are asteroids that have orbits that cross the orbit of the Earth. There are thousands of them, by the way. Now just because it crosses our orbit doesn't mean it's bad. You cross the street every day. Not at the same time that the truck is there. You're there at different times. It's safe when you're there at different times. It's not safe when you're there at the same time. So the whole study of near Earth objects is to find those that have us in their sights at the same time and at the same place. Because this is the kind of thing that would happen. <laughs> That's a bad day on Earth. <laughs> Artist Don Davis. It is for NASA. You don't want this. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we actually have craters on Earth. Well, we've been here. We, well, the Earth has a way of sort of rubbing out the evidence, covering it up, because we have erosion and rain and continental drift. But there are a couple of craters that are sort of reminders. Here's one. Arizona is known for its holes in the ground. This is one of them. Meteor Crater. That's about almost a mile across. You can sink a 60-story building in the center of this, and it will only barely reach the height of the rim. This crater is huge, and yet it's curiously small in terms of the, th the kinds of craters that can be left in the solar system. On one trip, I visited the Grand Canyon and Meteor Crater. I was 15 at the time. I was, went to the Grand Canyon, I looked at it, I said, oh, okay, that's nice. Okay. I came to this crater, it freaked me out. You know why? Okay, so you get the Grand Canyon, okay, millions of years to carve this thing. Meteor Crater, it took a tenth of a second to make this hole in the ground. That's scary, okay? <laughs> a tenth of a second. There. So, we've been here. This is in the desert where it hardly ever rains. That's why it's so well preserved. One of these hit long ago. Well, these hit all the time, but a really bad one hit long ago, 65 million years ago. There's an artist capturing of that. Got pterodactyls flying by. That, that asteroid is about six miles across. And it hits the, what is now the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. That is the famous KT impact. Cretaceous tertiary impact in the geologic record, which coincides with the extinction of all the evil dinosaurs of the day. No dinosaurs were left on the other side of that geological layer. This was devastating to the Earth. I want to show this, I'll show this in a, in a high school. And someone in the front row said, oh, Dr. Pesci, is that an actual photograph? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the pterodactyl had a digital camera at the time. 